Guys, guys, I'm gonna be honest with you. Spider-Man PS4 is a perfect Spider-Man game in story, characters, gameplay, graphics, and every single aspect packed with fan service. and oh my god, even the fucking Sam Raimi Spider-Man series in this game. This is the best superhero game ever made in the history of- Okay, let's start that again. Spider-Man PS4 is a near-perfect Spider-Man game starring everyone's favorite wall crawler and my favorite superhero. In a tightly woven story spanning great characters full of personality. And let me say this now, and I halfway hate saying this, but this game really does make you feel like Spider-Man. From the story, to the combat, to the choices you make, and all of it made better by a pitch perfect script by the likes of John Bakit, Benjamin Arfman, Kelsey Beecham of Insomniac Games. And man, Insomniac Games man, you guys did a great job. Insomniac Games has a perfect understanding of what makes Spider-Man slash Peter Parker such an engaging character, and it's woven into the story itself better than I ever could have hoped for. I know it may sound like I'm blowing my load a little bit early, but as a massive Spider-Man fan, this game is amazing, spectacular, and superior to any other Spider-Man ever, possibly, and easily would have been my game of the year last year, besides Smash Ultimate of course. But enough rambling on. You're probably asking, what exactly do you do in Spider-Man PS4? Well, before we do anything else, we should go over the game's story. And in case you didn't see it at the beginning of the video, I'm going full on spoilers saying as the game's been out for almost a year. But anyway, no more waiting around. Let's get started. We start on a lovely morning in modern day New York City in Peter Parker's apartment. Yes, I said apartment, as Insomniac Games made a great choice to age Peter up this time, and make him a 23 year old out of college dropping us right into a story, but more on that later. We then cut to Peter waking up to a crime alert involving the Kingpin, and this opening sequence is perfect might I add, as in this one opening we can see everything that makes this version of Spider-Man so incredible, as in this one shot we see him being a genius with a self-made toaster and technology in his Spider-Man mask, and we also see him having to make a tough choice with them either choosing to pay his rent or go after the Kingpin. But of course, Peter chooses to go after the Kingpin because it's the right thing to do. And it's just amazing that in this one opening sequence, we see just what kind of person Peter is in this game. I love watching it every time. But enough about that. After a brief introduction to web swinging, while Spidey talks to the captain of the police department, Yuri Watanabe, we're told that this could finally be the day the Kingpin gets put away after 8 years of constant battles. Which is great world building, might I add. And so from there you do what you'd expect from this type of event, from breaking into Kingpin's building, to learning how to perform basic combat, movement, wall crawling, dodging, and more. With some amazing set pieces, might I add. But eventually Spider-Man does make it to Kingpin's office as he's about to escape to a chopper. But Spidey won't let that happen as they duke it out in a pretty awesome first boss fight, made even better by the fact that while yes, you're fighting the Kingpin, you're still learning new things at the same time. But eventually, enough punches and a few epic quick time events later, the Kingpin's taken down for the count and finally sent off to jail. Soon after, we're introduced to a major area of Peter's life known as Feast, a homeless shelter which also happens to be where the always loving Aunt May makes her debut in this story, in addition to one Martin Lee, a seemingly kind man who is also the founder and owner of Feast, and a great friend to both Peter and May. And so from here on, everything in New York seems all fine and dandy, with you getting introduced to some basic side quests like activating the Shigata, I mean surveillance towers, Allowing you to view regions of New York City, allowing you to easily spot other side quests and crimes in progress, such as a bank robbery, or finding one of the many backpacks located across the city. Well, I'll talk about that stuff more later. Anyway, it seems like a normal life for Spider-Man, with Peter in this universe being a lab assistant to one Dr. Otto Octavius as his normal job, with him of course balancing his life with Spider-Man. But trouble soon starts to arise a couple weeks later, when a crime gang known as the Demons begin to cause trouble for our friendly neighborhood wall crawler, with the first attack happening at an art auction after closing, where after some satisfying stealth and admittedly charming banter, we meet our next key character Mary Jane Watson, now a reporter for the Daily Bugle who gets caught up in this mess thanks to her just happening to be at the same art auction, right before the demons attacked where she was trying to investigate fist goods at said auction. But anyway, we soon cut to Peter and MJ talk about how she got involved in the whole fucking fiasco, cutting back to right before the demons attacked, where after a fairly brief stealth section where we take control of MJ, and we found out that the demons are after something known as Devil's Breath. 
So back is Spider-Man, and after a brief but fun fight with the Shocker, we cut to the next day back with Peter working with Dr. Octavius to fix up a robotic arm. But right after, we see the one and only Norman Osborn. Now the mayor of NYC barging into Octavius' lab, where we start to see the friction Otto and Norman obviously have for each other, taken right out of the comics and Spectacular Spider-Man. With Norman cutting the funding in an attempt to get Otto to work at Oscorp, instead prompting Otto to suggest for Peter to have another job in mind. Soon after, we cut back to Spider-Man and find that the Shocker has already escaped prison and is now in the middle of robbing another bank, prompting you to go stop him again. Now in most situations like this where you have to fight the same character again, it can be really repetitive with games such as Skyward Sword and Sonic Adventure definitely coming to mind. But it works in Spider-Man's case because A. The whole fight is completely different from the first encounter where we were chasing him across the city. We're here this time we're fighting him in a condensed make with a bigger focus on reaction time and dodging. But anyway, both fights are awesome. But two, this fight actually serves as a plot point as we then find out that Shocker was actually doing this for someone else and that Yuri did some investigation work behind the scenes about the demon attack from the other night, leading us to a seemingly abandoned building now heavily guarded by demons all around. Oh. A handful of cell takedown later, and we meet a new character in the form of Officer Jefferson Davis, who offers to investigate the warehouse with Spider-Man, leading us to find out that the demons were and still are here to raid one of Kingpin's weapon supplies, leading to an epic car chase across the city, ending with Officer Davis saving Spider-Man's life, after Spider-Man always gets rammed by the demons lifting up an oil tanker from a subway train. All is well for Spider-Man and Officer Davis as Officer Davis gets announced a hero to the city with Spider-Man basically going back to status quo, just like in the comics. But not all is well for Peter as later that night we see him being outright evicted from his apartment and now has to find his stuff for sitting to the incinerator. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now don't worry, this eviction isn't completely out of nowhere as we get a call from the landlord a couple of days earlier while Peter's Spider-Man claiming his past is due. See? Foreshadowing! But back to the present, Spider-Man does thankfully find his stuff, leading Peter to have to find someone to sleep, which admittedly makes for some great insight into Peter's relationship issues with MJ, with them now being friends. Really? But anyway, after enough farting around, Peter finds himself crashing at feast on Aunt May's couch in her office overnight. The next morning, we find Peter waking up to some money on the table in front of him. May decides to give it to him to help him potentially pay for a new apartment. And after swallowing his pride Parker Pride, we then see Martin Lee once again with him informing Peter and May that he'll be going out of town for a while for take care personal me. business, whatever that means. Right after, Peter then gets a call from NJ informing him that Officer Davis will be getting a ceremony alongside Norman Osborn's re-election, celebrating his efforts in helping Spider-Man with the demons, with MJ inviting him as she would. But before anyone has time to party, it's time to go back to doing more Spider-Man stuff, as Spidey gets a message of the demon's next location at a construction site, where they are slaughtering Kingpin's men with the wall crawler making a deal that if he saves them, he'll tell more about what the demons are after. And he goes to do just that with an insane action sequence with Spider-Man playing catch up with the demons in a helicopter with a crate attached to it, crashing into multiple buildings, ending with Spider-Man stopping the helicopter from completely crashing into New York City. With him webbing up the bulk of it, ending with a shot of Spider-Man looking like it's taken right out of the comic book. But man, this action scene is amazing. Seeing Spider-Man go from stopping a crane from slicing into a building, while simultaneously giving me some Spider-Man 3 vibes, to web swinging across the New York skylines dodging all types of destruction in its path, to doing parkour into a helicopter, breaking the helicopter engines while avoiding gunshots, man, it's just awesome. And it's without doubt one of the best set pieces in the entire game, with a great sense of scope while also getting a glance into Peter's thought process when having to stop the plane. Expect more of those set pieces, by the way, but back to the story at hand. With the helicopter chase finally over, Peter finally heads to the ceremony where I'm sure nothing could possibly go wrong. Holy shit, what the fuck? Oh my god! Yeah, in a tragic turn of events, the demons, surprise surprise, show up at the ceremony, with many of them exploding and killing dozens of citizens, with Officer Davis among many others, even knocking out Peter in the explosion. We then take control of new character Miles Morales, a 15 year old kid who just witnessed, you guessed it, the death of his father, Officer Davis. But it gets even crazier as, playing through the stealth section with Miles, reveals to us that the person in the attack was none other than... Martin Lee, yeah, Martin Lee, aka Mr. Negative, was pulling the strings the whole time, 
and we even see the demons executing multiple survivors of the whole fucking fiasco, with this event ending the first act of the game and establishing the demons as a true threat. We then cut to a few days later at Officer Davis's funeral where we see the first character interactions between Peter and Miles, Do with Peter trying to make Miles feel better any way he can, with Miles understandably not in the mood. I, I can't really blame him. Anyway, soon after, Spider-Man locates another one of the demon's hideouts and even stumbles upon a paper in the building of all the locations where the demons have set a shop across the city. Minutes later, Spider-Man is then confronted by a couple heavily armed soldiers telling him to stand down with Spider-Man taking them down with basic ease. But it's not all black and white, but actually Silver, er, Silver Sable, I am so sorry, who comes to the city with all her forces to try and stop the demons themselves, with Spidey and Sable forming a rivalry of such. But let's cool down for a minute and go a little more down back to Earth with Miles Morales, who Peter's just to go help Aunt May at feast as a way to help Miles pick himself up after the death of his father. But not after Peter does a little detective work into Martin Lee's office and discovers bits and pieces of his plan. But as smart as Peter is, he isn't always that slick as right when he leaves he runs into Martin Lee, who vaguely threatens Peter because Lee's not stupid and... Woo! Okay. Let's take a little break and go back to Peter's personal life. Well, thankfully, the game cuts back to our favorite non-Parker scientist, Otto Octavius, who thankfully is not going to go under and had found some loans as well as new supplies through the lab, which means Peter can thankfully keep his job. While all this is going on in the lab, we actually get some backstory as to why Otto hates Norman so much, as Otto explains to Peter that back in their college days, they were actually partners and best friends until the two split up for some reason. Anyway, hours later, we see Peter swing by MJ's apartment to cook dinner, and she reveals us through... <sighs> Another stealth section. I'll get more into why I don't like these later. She went sneaking around a body shop learning about more of Martin Lee's plan with the help of Tombstone. I fucking love this guy. And is apparently building some sort of super armor vehicle for reasons we don't know yet. Anyway, just as the two of them were about to have dinner, Peter unfortunately gets a police alert involving the demons, prompting him to suit up as the wall crawler to go and see what they have in store for him this time. Involving an awesome action sequence with him crawling up the inside of a tall ass building, avoiding elevators, demons with sniper rifles, and even fire, all in an effort to save Osborne's CFO Charles Standish. It then turns out that the demons went to invade his place because he knows some shit about what Martin Lee and the demons are after known as Devil's Breath. But it seems the demons made one mistake and that is that when Standish talks to Spider-Man, he reveals that he doesn't actually know what Devil's Breath is or what it does, and for that to happen, he would need to find one Do Dr. Isaac Delaney leading him through an amusing Halloween party with some New York citizens dressing up as some of Spider-Man's past foes, which is a great way to do some light world building. But anyway, things don't look too bright as minutes later, we find that Lee has gone to Delaney first, prompting Lee to use his... negative powers to have Delaney shoot himself in the head. But before he does, he does give Spider-Man a name to search for in the form of Dr. Morgan Michaels. And after a good dose of fighting the demons, Spider-Man decides to do a little detective work to get some leads of Michaels, which leads him to Oscorp Tower, where he breaks into Norman Osborn's office to see just what the hell Devil's Breath is. Hacking into Norman's computer, Spider-Man finds out that Devil's Breath was designed to be a cure of some sort of medical purpose, to cure multiple diseases including cancer, of all things. But in its current state, it's a highly destructive drug capable of killing loads of people out of easy time and that Lee wants to use it to ruin Osborne's name for reasons I'll get into later. But before leaving, Spider-Man also finds that Michaels also carries a sample of the chemical at all times to make sure it doesn't get into the wrong hands. At the same time, Mary Jane is also doing some detective work of her own at one of the many operations where Silver Sable, yeah, remember her, and her men have set up shop and are currently holding Michaels to make sure he doesn't get caught by the demons. But anyway, MJ sneaks through the guards to try to get to Michaels to try to help him, but unfortunately Spider-Man comes to the rescue at the wrong time after a phone call in the wrong place, scaring Michaels and alerting the guards, with Peter enormously fucking up. Sorta. Leaving MJ in a fucking mood. But with all this information in hand, the next day we cut to Silver Sable's forces transporting Michaels to a safe house, but lo and behold the demons are right on their trail with a big battle tank vehicle that Tombstone I mentioned. More foreshadowing! And kidnaps Michaels with Spider-Man on the trail, with like in the helicopter sequence, is another amazing action set piece with the tank zooming across the city causing all sorts of destruction in their wake with Spider-Man on the truck taking on the demon, with Sable's men in pursuit all at the same time. 
it's a pretty crazy sequence with some amazing callbacks to their Spider-Man sequences. I'll talk about that more later. And somehow develops Martin Lee more as a character while this is all happening. With him grabbing Spider-Man using his negative energy on Spider-Man, showing him a twisted and outright fucked up reality, which also looks amazing by the way. But anyway, this shows more motivation of Martin without giving away what he's after, and that it reveals he wants to completely ruin Osborne for his supposed crimes, and then proceeds to attempt to guilt trip Spider-Man into making the explosion at the ceremony his fault. But Spidey isn't falling for any of that shit, and proceeds to prunce the shit out of Martin and return to reality, with the taint finally crashing into a building. With Spider-Man losing consciousness as a result, soon after Spidey wakes up along with Michaels and makes the horrible discovery that Lee's made off with the devil's breath and can potentially set it off at any second. With no time to lose Spider-Man, I mean Mary Jane, somehow, discovers where Martin Lee is going to next and sets her destination there and tells Peter to meet her there as well. After some interesting stealth with some third person perspective of watching Spider-Man take out some thugs with MJ gives the word, it's a pretty interesting sequence, but to be honest, all I think in this section is, man, I wish I was doing that. But anyway, during the whole sequence with Peter's help, Mary Jane deactivates Devil's Breath, with Lee prompted to retreat onto a subway train with Spider-Man hot on his tail. And after an epic boss fight with them on two different trains, Lee's knocked out, but the train's not stopping, with Spider-Man having to stop the train at all costs. With an amazing shout out to a certain moment in Spider-Man's career, but it fails and says Spider-Man lifts up the railway tracks and asks the train stop above ground with Lee promptly being sent to the raft. An island off Manhattan containing many of Spider-Man's most dangerous foes. We'll talk about them later. So the end, right? The day is saved and everything goes back to normal with the demon seemingly out of commission. Everyone's good to go, right? Wrong! Nah, the story doesn't end there, but back to business. Soon after Lee's arrest, we cut back to Octavius's lab and we see the progress Otto's made in Peter's absence. I'm sorry I haven't given him enough attention to him. But anyway, with all the work they've been doing throughout the game, we can see that the work has transformed into four robotic arms that can be controlled through the brain. But here's the catch. It isn't exactly finished, and can potentially corrupt your mind, altering things like personality and goals. But this is tandem with the fact that earlier in the game, Otto tells Peter that he's slowly beginning to lose some of his motor functions to his muscle spells disaster. But being the great person Peter is, convinces Otto to stop using the chip to control the arms and give it more time. But due to Peter Parker being Spider-Man, Peter has to leave again, leaving Otto alone in the lab again, and sees Norman on the TV prompting Otto to take revenge on him after all these years properly setting him up to become Dr. Octopus slash Doc Ock. Later that night, after also searching for the Devil's Breath after the Martin Lee debacle, Spider-Man meets up with Yuri on a helicopter and is informed that shit's going down on the raft in one of the best sequences of the entire game might I add, with every criminal being released from their cell trying to kill Spider-Man all at the same time. And after a pretty wild sink was taking out every mook on the raft between dodging missiles and gunshots, Everything falls apart when the actual real threat arrives as all of Spider-Man's super-powered villains get freed following an epic chase with Electro up to a roof where him alongside Scorpion, Rhino, Vulture, and Mr. Negative all gang up on the webhead and beat the absolute shit out of him in an honestly pretty brutal sequence. But just as it's about to end, it turns out that Dog Ock was behind the entire prison break and him alongside all the other villains form the Sinister Six. And as a longtime Spider-Man fan, I have one thing to say. This is so Each fucking awesome! Holy shit, they did an amazing Sensor 6 Oh my god, it's so developed! Ahem. <laughs> anyway, with Spider-Man down for the count, the Sinister 6 began to rampage all over the city with Doc Ock releasing Devil's Breath beginning to infect the city with many being sick including Aunt May. With Spider-Man waking up partially recovering from his injuries, he finds the city in shambles with him taking out some prison thugs to try and calm down the city at least a little bit. And after saving Aunt May, Miles, and MJ from a burning building, they all begin to make a move to take back the city. With Miles doing everything he can to help back at feasts, and MJ doing detective work to find out how to reverse the devil's breath, and Spider-Man, well, basically being Spider-Man, which leads him to Doc Ock's hideout where he finds out that one, Doc Ock was actually helping on ways to help each member of the Six with whatever they want, such as helping the Rhino get out of his suit, or helping Electro become pure energy, whatever that means. Spider-Man then finds a map of New York showing where each member of the Six are going to strike, ending with Doc Ock talking to Spider-Man through a video explaining that he knew he would find this place. But soon after, the place gets nuked leading into a battle with Electro and the Vulture. 
I'd also like to add that this is an awesome pairing for two reasons. One, because it leads to an incredibly awesome boss fight where you find both of them at the same time. And two, I can sort of recreate this awesome fight from Spectacular Spider-Man. Don't worry, Volts. Electro's got your back. No, you fool! I'll be free in a moment! Ah! You pull up a quick McPlate? The quick McPlate? But anyway, from here on, you basically fight all the members of the Sinister Six in Paris with some twists thrown in here and there like a trippy dream sequence, which boasts both an awesome fight with the Scorpion, as well as a great look into Peter's psyche into the whole situation of Octavius becoming Doc Ock, after serving as a mentor and partner to Peter, with Peter feeling responsible for his turn to villainy. It makes you feel really bad for you because you can tell that it really wasn't his fault and was out of his control. But still blaming for himself for this is something I can relate to on a personal level. But moving on. As I said before, you mostly fight the Sinister Six in pairs, starting with Electro and Voltra as I just discussed, then moving on to Scorpion and the Rhino. But after that, here's where things get a little complicated. If you remember before where after the train fight Lee gets sent to the raft, you may be asking yourself, what was Lee's true motivation and why didn't his story feel finished? Well here's the thing. While Spider-Man is dealing with the Sinister Six, you get one final stealth section with Mary Jane as she sneaks into Norman Osborn's penthouse to get some more intel on how to reverse Devil's Breath. While she is here, she also finds out where Harry Osborn, Norman's son, has been all this time. For those of you who don't follow a lot of Spider-Man, Harry Osborn plays a major role in Spider-Man's history alongside Norman Osborn, so to have him completely absent in the story may seem very strange. But it's not like he's completely gone in this universe, as multiple times throughout the game, Peter or MJ bring up that the three of them hung out all the time when they were kids and their high school years. And that Harry supposedly went to Europe for the summer, which is why he's never directly heard from in the story. Well, this is where that plot point comes into fruition, as MJ finds out that Harry actually had a disease that made him very sick, and it was also the death of his mother, and for years hid his illness from Peter and MJ, and made the excuse of going on a trip to Europe to disguise the fact he was actually going into a holding tank in a lab unconscious for a long time until Norman could create a cure for his condition, which is the reason why this lab is here in the first place. But while MJ is in the lab, she finds out the reason for all Martin Lee's actions and finds an old video involving a young Martin Lee with his parents and an accident performed by Norman Osborn performing an experiment killing both of his parents as well as giving Lee his powers creating Mr. Negative in the first place. But hey, speaking of Mr. Negative, it's finally time to take him down once and for all with an insane boss fight with Spider-Man both fighting Mr. Negative for the final time, at times taking the form of an actual demon, while also trying to help Lee return to the light and to not let revenge consume him. But after their thrilling battle, Lee's down for the count for the final time. But it's not over yet as Dog Ock decides to make his move and beats the absolute shit out of Spider-Man, knocking him unconscious and taking Norman Osborn hostage as a result. A few hours later after recovering from his injuries, Peter heads back to Otto's lab one last time and prepares a new suit to take on Doc Ock so he won't kill Norman. And so the final battle ensues with Ock permanently turning to the dark side and him even admitting that he knew Peter was Spider-Man all along. And so they take the fight lower on the building, both tired, but just as it seems Peter is about to gain the upper hand, Ock outright stabs Peter in the shoulder with one of his tentacles with him taunting the newly created anti-serum for Devil's Breath created by Dr. Michaels. But Peter outsmarts Otto and rips the chip out of his neck controlling the arms, with them both falling into the building with Peter regaining the anti-serum, and Peter basically giving up on Otto after everything that happened, with Peter now rushing in time to try and save a dying at May as a result of Devil's Breath. He makes it in time but is left with a choice between using it now to save Aunt May, or use it to save the rest of New York. In the end, he makes the right choice to save everyone else, but Aunt May unfortunately dies of her illnesses in an honestly heartbreaking scene. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so everyone attends May's funeral. Peter and MJ rekindled their relationship, and everything seems to go back to normal after around three weeks. But it's not quite over yet, as at the very end it's real that Miles Morales gains spider powers similar to Peter after a spider from MJ's jacket bites Miles from Norman's lab while Miles is at feast. And so he tells Peter the news, and Peter also reveals to him that he's Spider-Man. That's basically the end of it, folks. And yes, I know about the DLC that technically continues the story, and I would cover it, but to be honest, I haven't actually played it yet. 
Maybe another day. Look folks, I know at the end of the day there are a lot of different people who look for a lot of different things in a Spider-Man story, but folks, in my opinion at least, this is possibly a perfect Spider-Man story in every aspect. In my opinion, the very best incarnation of Peter Parker slash Spider-Man since the spectacular Spider-Man TV show and the Raimi films. This Peter is a great person, and in Sonya Games perfectly encapsulates everything that makes this character so interesting. They do a great job showing how hard it is for Peter to balance his normal life with being a superhero. They show him having a bunch of real life problems that we can relate to as people, which is one of the reasons he's so great, cause that's always been one of Spider-Man's defining traits, his relatability. Yeah, he's a 23 year old man dressed up in tight spandex to go fight crime, but he still runs into real life consequences, he still has relationship problems, he struggles being able to make ends meet, he tries to be here to help everyone in his life. But you know what? Everything goes wrong in Peter's life. He gets kicked out of his apartment, Martin Lee becomes a super criminal, his former mentor and friend Otto becomes Doc Ock and nearly destroys the city, and May dies right in front of him, but you know what? At the end of it all, he stays positive. He keeps on fighting the good fight. He continues to try and make things right. By the end of the game, everyone he looks up to is either dead or goes down a dark path, but he still remains upbeat, and that's what makes him so amazing. That's what makes this man so spectacular. That's what makes this incredible man, Spider-Man. Yuri Lowenthal is Peter Parker. You never hear someone in your recording booth trying his best to sound like Peter Parker. Yuri brings this Peter Parker to life. He hits every emotional beat perfectly. His performance in Aunt May's death made me cry. Yes, I cried in a Spider-Man game. But that's just how great a job he does in this role. The rest of the cast is great as well, with my two favorite standouts being Martin Lee and Octavius. When I was going over the plot, I may not have talked about these guys as much as I should have, but both of these characters do a great job in both sides of their stories. But first, let's talk about Martin Lee. Now, as a huge Spider-Man fan, I hadn't really heard of Mr. Negative before this game, but seeing as this game introduced me to the character of Martin Lee slash Mr. Negative, Mr. Negative is a great villain and given a great backstory while also being given a perfectly valid reason for his crimes, making him for one of the best Spider-Man villains I've seen in a long time. And his powers are also awesome, and very unique might I add. Now let's get into Doc Ock. Now what's amazing about this version of Otto Octavius is that in some of games heavily plays on your expectations, as if you've ever been a Spider-Man fan at any point in your life, you know damn well that he tragically becomes Doc Ock. So what does Insomniac games do? They make the player not want Octavius to become Doc Ock, as through the first half to two thirds of the game's story, they show you the relationship that Peter and Octavius share when they're working together, with Otto being Peter's mentor and a father figure of sorts, while also being a really good friend to Peter. And all this becomes all the more tragic when he does finally become Doc Ock and starts to wreak havoc across the city. It was a really great way to spin a classic Spider-Man story on our heads. So bravo Insomniac Games! Other characters like Miles, MJ, and Aunt May also get plenty to do, with Aunt May as always being Peter's moral compass as always, and Miles being a great supporting character also giving some insight into what it's like being a normal kid in Spider-Man's world. And after the game ends, I can absolutely not wait to see where they take the character next. I'd also like to add that while yes, Into the Spider-Verse is an amazing Spider-Man movie, it makes Miles a great character, I'd honestly like to argue that Spider-Man PS4 beat Into the Spider-Verse to the punch and made the first steps to make Miles Morales an interesting character because, to be honest, in the comics, he's admittedly not that great of a character, with him basically just being another Peter Parker with a less compelling backstory. But this game gives Miles his own identity, thus making him be able to stand out as his own character and not just Peter Parker Jr. Like some other version I know. But anyway, the last character I'd like to talk about is Mary Jane Watson, and Insomniac Games does not disappoint in this regard either with her now being a reporter for the Daily Bugle. And while some people may complain she might be giving off too many Lois Lane-like vibes with her now reporter status, I'd argue that it was a great direction for her character, while not just making her the damsel in distress like so many other versions make her out to be. But with all that said, you're probably wondering, how does Spider-Man play as a game? Because after all I've said, it has an amazing story and characters and direction, but how does it perform outside of that? While well, someone who's played his fair share of Spider-Man games, I can say this is easily the best Spider-Man game ever, as well as one of the best superhero games ever, in my opinion. But it's not perfect. This game is basically split in half between playing a Spider-Man who does whatever a spider can. And then there's everything that is not Spider-Man stuff, 
which is admittedly where I think the game falters a bit. And that's where I'm going to start because then after that we can get to the really good stuff. So to start with, when you're not living the amazing fantasy <laughs> of Spider-Man, you can take control of either Peter Parker, Miles Morales, or Mary Jane. I'm going to say this now, it's not all bad. As when you're not Spider-Man, you'll either be doing stealth missions with MJ or Miles, or doing stuff in Otto's lab with Peter Parker, usually involving these weird lab puzzles. I'm going to start here. These lab puzzles are easily the least interesting part of the game, because besides gaining some experience points for upgrades and unlockables, they don't really add anything to the game on a gameplay level. Some of them just feel so out of nowhere and serve as a complete pace breaker when you're not Spider-Man. But here's the thing. These puzzles really aren't even that bad. They're fine and serve a nice little distraction when you want to cool off a little bit. But they just seem so out of place when the other 90% of the game is so flawless by comparison. It just makes these stick out more than they should be. And this argument also kind of extends to the cell sections with Miles and MJ. Now I'll say this. The stealth sections with MJ throughout the game do get slightly better over the course of the story, with her getting a few gadgets like a stun gun and a little noise button distracting whoever you use it on within like range. But they're nowhere near as fun as the rest of the game because all you want to do when you get through these sections is get through them as fast as possible so you can get back to the Spider-Man stuff. But it's made almost a little insulting by the fact that if you know what you're doing, you can easily slide past the retarded ass AI they have set up in these sections. And this also extends to Miles sections, which might even be worse as unlike MJ, who at least gets a few cool things in her missions, Miles only hacks a few drones here and there, which makes them even less interesting. Now as I said before, these stealth sections are definitely not the worst thing ever. But like the lab puzzles with Peter, they just put the game to a grinding halt in terms of progression, and I felt that they really weren't necessary. Or if they were necessary, I think that Sony had games could have made them more exciting. But now let's get on a wildly more positive note with the amazing Spider-Man. Playing with Spider-Man in this game is pretty much flawless in execution. It's amazing how much personality they also crammed into this gameplay. And if there's something you want to do, you can probably do it. Now admittedly, there is definitely a bit of a learning curve to Spider-Man's moveset. But once you get the hang of it, he controls like an absolute dream. You can web zip between skyscrapers and poles, obviously crawl up walls and run up walls, and all of Spider-Man's moves each have a unique animation to give life to this version of Spider-Man in game. But what's a Spider-Man game without web swinging? And holy shit is web swinging incredibly fulfilling in this game. Web swinging, while being the main way to travel across New York, is also just incredibly fun to do with you being able to perform tricks, some taken right out of the movies, and parkour across buildings along the way, with you being able to jump off skyscrapers and do a speedy web swing with some satisfying momentum and oh my god guys, this is so much fun to swing around this game. And it's probably what a good chunk of your experience will be. I have no idea why Fast Travel is an option in a game like this. Because while it's fun to see Spider-Man hanging out on the subway talking to a random citizen or hanging out on his phone, West Wing is definitely the way to go in terms of traversal. But what do you do with Spider-Man if there's nothing to do besides swinging? Well, Insomniac Games came through in this regard to do as well, because when you're just in downtime, you can stop a crime in progress like stopping a robbery by some thieves not those thieves, or engaging in an exciting car chase across the city, which are super awesome by the way, which also means I can recreate this right from the spectacular Spider-Man. But anyway, outside of the main story and crimes in progress, in a semi-open world game like this, there are plenty of side quests to keep you busy, such as taking down the demon's operations you uncover in the main story, solving some of Black Cat's supposed robberies, or some bigger stuff like tracking down Tombstone who you heard from earlier in the game. There are even more than, than these ones I just mentioned, but most of them are pretty awesome gaining you experience points, or in Black Cat's case, unlocking you a new suit. But hey, speaking of suits, let's talk unlockables. So as I talked about before, you can unlock a ton of Spider-Man suits like the Raimi suit, among other awesome suits like the Iron Spider suit from Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, the three Spider-Man suits from the Homecoming and Far From Home movies, the Spider-Man 2099 suit from the 2099 comic series, and even some really classic ones like the suit he used to try and win some money in his origins. But Insomniac Games did a great job representing all aspects of Spider-Man's long and treasured history. 
Now, the suits are the major bulk of unlockables in this game, with the other unlockables coming in the form of Spider-Man's many gadgets and moves in the skill tree, which leads me into combat. Now, in this game, the combat in Spider-Man is amazing, with a free-flowing system making proper use of all of Spider-Man's abilities. Do you wish to crawl into the shadows and do some stealth takedowns from a distance using gadgets like the Trip Mine to trap enemies in webs when they walk over them? Or do you dive in headfirst performing multiple combos in conjunction with using webs, web balls, spider drones, electric webs, and more? But at the core of it, the entire combat system all revolves around your focus meter as well as your spider sense. In this game, when you do damage to enemies, make a perfect dodge using your spider sense to detect danger, make clever use of your gadgets, and build up your combos, all of it is added to your focus meter and when charged up, can either be used to heal mid-fight or when maxed out can be used to kill enemies in a super flashy one hit kill, or recover more health, obviously. With one of them might I add, also referencing Spider-Man 2002. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but good on you in so many games. You can also make use of the environment around you throwing cans or boxes at enemies, or webbing them up when they're knocked down to make sure they don't get back up. Spider-Man's combat is immensely satisfying in every sense of the word. All in all, Spider-Man's movement throughout the whole game is incredibly fun to explore and experiment. It feels just as exciting and frantic as it should. And speaking of flashy, this game is so beautiful. Like guys, this game has some of the most dazzling lighting I've ever seen in a video game, with the sunset definitely being my favorite. The way it reflects off of all of Spider-Man's costumes, I'll just show that it looks like all of Spider-Man's different costumes are all made out of a different material. And that extra detail is just really, really nice. Speaking of details, this game is New York and its people all look really nice. Now in a lot of past Spider-Man games, when you're swinging around New York, you tend to see a lot of buildings that look exactly the same and look really bland and just look like rectangles with textures slapped on. And it's Sonic 06. But here in Spider-Man PS4, there is a ton of variety to the city of New York in this game and there are a ton of different types of buildings. And if you stop to look inside windows a little bit, you'll actually see fully detailed rooms and such. And there are also tons of buildings with graffiti and things that would totally make sense in a place like New York. Damn guys, this game just looks amazing. And also, all the human models also look totally lifelike and actually look like real people. I'd also like to point out that New York is incredibly lively in this game, with, as I just said, you being able to high-five a random guy in the city, and traffic being always on, day and night. No wonder it's called the city that never sleeps. Spider-Man PS4 also boasts in a great soundtrack with the main theme being absolutely incredible, giving flashbacks to the Raimi films in its scope with the choir coming in at points. And is definitely something I'll remember as Spider-Man music. Okay, wow guys. I think this review has gone on long enough. To sum it up, Spider-Man PS4 is an exciting, action-packed, beautiful love layer to everything Spider-Man jam-packed with references to other movies and comic strips, and bursting with fan service from every corner, but also miraculously does a great job standing on its own as its own interpretation of Spider-Man, I cannot wait for the inevitable sequel to this story. So with all that said guys, I hope all you true believers have a wonderful night, take care, and go play this beautiful game.